Greetings, Coronado family and friends. I realize that we're in the midst of some very crazy times, both in our country politically as well as with the pandemic being at the worst it's ever been in Florida, in Volusia County, and locally in Edgewater and New Smyrna Beach and Port Orange. But it feels like the fact that we're starting to roll out the vaccine that we may be heading towards a time when we can reopen. And so as we prepare for that eventuality, we know we're going to need some help. We're going to need ushers and greeters with different roles than they have, in, have had in the past. We're going to need temperature takers and reservation checkers. Our weekly needs will be different than they were before the pandemic and life felt normal. If you have interest in any of those things, if you would be interested in serving in any of those capacities, we want to begin collecting names and finding individuals who can help us. So either call, make in or I, the church office, or send us an email and say that you'd be interested. And if you've got parameters for safety reasons, go ahead and spell those out and let us know what you're willing to help with and what you want to be careful of. We're particularly aware that we will need some folks who are willing to engage in technology. For the past 10 going on 11 months, we, the pastors at Coronado, have been our own cameramen, camera women, our own producers, our own editors, and we know we won't be able to do that at the same time as we're doing a live service. When we have both in-person and live streaming, we're going to need some folks who can engage in helping with the technology. And we know that lots of folks don't really want to do that, so we need to start training people now so that we're ready. In case you want to know what you're getting into, it may mean helping us with a device called an ATEM Mini, which allows us to have multiple cameras. I'm controlling it now when I push that button and a different view comes up. And I need to not do that when I'm preaching. And the other piece of software that we want folks to be able to help us with is called OBS, Open Broadcasting Software. And you can watch some YouTube videos and find out if there's things there that you are curious about, and we'll do some training so that we can get some help. But it's really difficult for us to both produce the technological part of the videoing as well as participate in worship as we traditionally have known it. Let us know if you can help. Those are the announcements. This week we're starting a new sermon series on being United Methodist. We have many folks at Coronado who have been Methodist, United Methodist, for long periods of time in their life, and others who have not been, who have been part of other denominations, Roman Catholic, Presbyterian, Baptist, Lutheran, Episcopalians, there's Presbyterians, there's so many different different options. And our church has got a number of folks from different traditions. And not all Presbyterian churches and not all United Methodist churches are created equal. And so people have gotten used to things in certain ways in their own places. But we sometimes don't realize where it is that we have true common ground and where it is that we have emphasis that are gifts, let's say, to the Christian tradition. I want this five-week sermon series, so this week and four more, to allow us to claim the part of our tradition that is a gift to the Christian tradition and give us some of our identity as United Methodists today. I'm not going to talk too much about history. 
and hopefully not much at all about the structure of the church. But if those are of interest to you, then let us know, and we would see about, we'll see about putting together some kind of small group and have discussions about those kind of things. But your eyes would glaze over if I started talking about some of the church structure issues. I have been a United Methodist all of my life. I was confirmed after 1968, and so when I was confirmed, I was confirmed into the United Methodist Church. My parents were United Methodist and Methodist before that, and my mom's father was a United Methodist pastor in Michigan and a Methodist pastor before that, and possibly a Methodist Episcopal Church North pastor before that. I went to a United Methodist undergrad, Florida Southern College in Lakeland, Florida, and then attended the Divinity School at Duke University for my my master's degree, another United Methodist institution. Quite frankly, I love the United Methodist Church. Most of my years as a pastor, I have considered it a great value that we had such theological diversity in the church people Some who are very conservative and some who are very progressive and most probably in the middle. I considered that a value in part because it meant that we would engage in theological conversations from multiple sides and it wasn't a simple, that's what we believe and we're done. It was a dialogue, a conversation, a discussion and it pushed us all deeper. As you know, this wide range of diversity, of thinking, of theology, has caused great challenges in recent years. And it seems that this diversity will cause a split in the church in the next few years. The scripture I'd like to use this morning as we do this introduction to the sermon series on being a United Methodist, comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Listen. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I chose this scripture in part because of the incredible emphasis that John Wesley made, both on unconditional love, specifically using 1 John chapter 4, and grace. And he parsed our understanding of grace in a way that other theologians had not done. And so he offered a gift to the Christian tradition in the way he talked about grace. There are many different pieces of unique theological emphasis that John Wesley gives to us Christians as a gift. One is the Wesleyan quadrilateral, and we'll talk about that. Another is talking about the middle way. Another still is the balance between personal piety and social holiness. And I would say a critical part of the tradition, a gift from Wesley, is the emphasis on free will versus predestination. Those particular issues and values and emphasis will be part of the sermon series over the next four weeks. But I invite you, in the meantime, if you're so inclined, if you're interested, to look into part of what it means to be a United Methodist by looking at the General Church's website at umc.org and seeing what we believe. At the very beginning of the discipline of the United Methodist Church, it's the book that we use that tells us who we are and who we're supposed to be now, who we've been, who we are, where we're going. It's really important in that very beginning to lay out that there is this common ground that we share theologically with the entire Christian church. 
The United Methodist Church is not an exclusive church that says if you don't follow these particular parameters, you are not going to heaven or you can't be a member or you can't call yourself a Christian. We celebrate an open table. We preach unconditional love. And we seek to follow the way of Jesus and bring the entire Christian tradition some emphasis, some added flavor and benefit to the tradition. In the book of discipline under the topic doctrine and discipline in the Christian life, we have these words. The general rules were originally designed for members of the Methodist societies who participated in the sacramental life of the Church of England. The terms of membership in the societies were simple. A desire to flee from the wrath to come and to be saved from their sins. Wesley insisted, however, that evangelical faith should manifest itself in evangelical living. He spelled out this expectation in a three-part formula of rules. It is therefore expected of all who continue there in that they should continue to evidence their desire for salvation. First, by doing no harm, by avoiding evil of every kind. Secondly, by doing good of every possible sort and as far as possible to all. Thirdly, by attending upon all the ordinances of God. And as an aside, it has a little thing that says, See paragraph 104. And paragraph 104, which explains our doctrinal standards and the general rules, talk about faith, the Trinity, the Word, the Son of Man, who was made very man, the resurrection of Christ, of the Holy Ghost, of the sufficiency of Holy Scriptures for salvation, of the Old Testament, of original or birth sin, of free will, of justification of faith, lots and lots and lots of paragraphs of doctrine. It's a long list. But these general rules speak to the heart of what it means to be in the tradition of John Wesley. First, do no harm. It is the heart of the reason we are being very careful about opening to in-person worship. It is the heart of why we continue to be in dialogue about racism. It is the heart of why we work so hard in our conversation about human sexuality. First, do no harm. It seems simple. It's very simple to say. And most of us would struggle to disagree. But it's not so simple to do. And John Wesley was very keen on making sure our beliefs and our actions acted as one. So let me leave you with this one lesson for today. First, do no harm. Dear friends, you are loved. I hope you are holding up. And I hope to see you in person soon. Go in peace. Amen. And amen.